Aman is not feeling well this morning, so I'm your substitute host. I'm sure I don't need to introduce Venerable Rabina, our precious teacher. Um, so good to see you. And this morning, our topic is the sufferings of samsara. And this is the last session of this series. So what are we, it's a morning in San Francisco and it's evening in, uh, evening oh. in India. <laughs> what time is it? 9 p.m. in India, is it? Yeah, it is. But it seems like there's nobody from India here. What happened? I am, I am Deepti. I'm from Who's India. Here? Oh, good. I'm very happy to see you. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well done, Brian. Good. So what's our topic today, Mary Ellen? The topic today is the sufferings of samsara. The sufferings of samsara. Wow. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about that. Um, yeah. So important to, okay, we just think we're going to be here for this hour. We'll discuss these topics. Um, the sufferings of samsara is so interesting, isn't it? Samsara is such an easy word for us to say. It's such a cliched word, and we even like this word. You know, we have perfumes called samsara. We have bands called samsara. So it's like it's almost nice to hear that you're in samsara. You know, and then the cliched kind of. I think the cliched idea of samsara is that we feel we ha it's your, where you're allowed to be naughty and have sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And then you've got to give it up and go to boring old nirvana. You know, so we have these awfully cliched ideas. But it's like also really, the, for Buddha, the word of being in samsara, I mean, I've no idea what the technical meaning is, I don't know what the translation is, is being caught up in misery. You know, having all the different le so-called levels of suffering that Buddha talks about. Being, you know, having uh, bad things happen, being killed, being lied to, being stolen from, having bad things happen. I mean, not to mention being born in the lower realms, that sounds pretty abstract to us. But if we look at it even in terms of this life, you know, we can see pretty clearly there is suffering. But what's interesting, the Buddha, and let's talk about that today. What's interesting, the Buddha's view of suffering, of course, when we look at the Four Noble Truths, he tells us about a subtler level of suffering. And this is where we really get into the nitty gritty of Buddha's understanding of the mind. Because I mean, of course, Buddha's expertise is the mind. The first level of suffering is pretty straightforward. You know, we all know we don't want that. We don't want people to be mean to us, lie to us, steal from us, husbands to cheat on us. That's pretty straightforward. We know we don't want that. And so, of course, you know, the Buddhist view is if you don't, if you, you know, if you have a problem, it's fairly evident you should identify the problem, be very precise about it. But it seems to me if you want to be free of that suffering, if you want to be free of that problem, I think it's really logical, isn't it? Whatever the problem is, you first identify the problem pretty clearly, but then you have to identify the causes. Because if you don't locate the causes of that problem, I don't think you'll ever find the solution. And that's why it's really practical. This, this practical presentation of the Buddha is his first teaching, actually, isn't it? That, you know, you first identify this first so-called the truth, these four facts for the Buddha, these four facts of life. Of course, they call them the four noble truths. But I've got a feeling these truths aren't noble. It's really the four facts about life for the noble ones, for those who've realized it. <clears throat> the four facts of life and these four facts here are called suffering actually the first one is there is suffering and then the second one is there are causes the third is you can get rid of them and the fourth is how to do it so it's very practical of course it's taught in enormous depth and it can be seen quite abstract to us but the most basic level you know buddha's describing what he's observed to be suffering and he said he's saying he's telling us that he has found solutions he has found methods to get rid of suffering, that suffering, but not just the suffering. He's also found methods, which I think is pretty crucial. He's found methods, he says, not just stop the suffering, which implies you have to know the cause, which is the second truth, the second fact. But he's telling us he's also found methods to actually stop the causes of it. So it's like if you've got a headache, you know, you, you know the problem's called a headache and you can stop the headache, you can take a pill. But we know it doesn't stop the causes. And that's what's pretty interesting, I think, you know, when you can get to the root cause. And sometimes we just want the quick fix. We're happy just to have the pill. But he's saying he's even not just a located a problem, but located a solution to stop the problem. He's located a solution that can enable us to stop the causes of it so that we don't have it again in the future. That's pretty good, I think. That's intelligent. We really need that. 
That's really the Buddhist teachings. I mean, you know, I often talk, but it's like there's different ways you can frame Buddhist teachings. One of them, this is clear, is in terms of happiness and suffering. So, of course, the interesting point when we've been discussing that this weekend here in, um, I mean, Zurich at the moment, we're discussing it in Zurich. Um, it's this word suffering and therefore the opposite called happiness. One way of framing all the Buddhist teachings, like I just said, is in terms of stopping suffering and therefore conclusion getting happiness because you just don't stop suffering. You replace it with the opposite, which is happiness. So it's pretty clear, I think, that we, be, we better understand the Buddhist analysis of these words. We shouldn't just take it for granted. We understand what he's saying. And I think this is the crucial thing. This is where we really can begin to understand what Buddha is saying. So we use our own understanding. When we say suffering, what we mean usually is we describe the event. We describe the thing the person did to us. We describe, you know, um, so in us, and then we, and the two things we, so, if, you know, if you're crying and Mary Yellen says to me, Rabina, what's wrong? What are you crying for? Why are you suffering? I will tell her about what the boyfriend did, which as far as I am concerned is the main cause of my suffering. This is how we think. And no one doubts that we don't question that assumption, you know, and you wouldn't if you heard, if Mary Ellen heard me talk, hear about how terrible my, 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 my boyfriend was, she would understand that I'm sad. I'm suffering. He caused it. He punched me in the nose. Look at the blood. Look at the broken nose. You know, that's what we say. So we call the stuff mainly the, the suffering, though. We seem to, you know, we and there's happiness as well. Why are you happy, Rabina? I will tell you the nice thing your boyfriend did. This is completely normal. Or I'll tell you about the delicious meal. Or I'll tell you about the lovely rainbow I saw. Or I'll tell you about the lovely concert I went to. And so we don't question this. But actually, it's really short. It's very, it's actually not accurate. From the Buddhist point of view, First of all, what we think, what we're doing is actually describing what we think the cause is. We're not describing the happiness. This is a very interesting point. You're actually describing the thing you think is the cause of it, the beautiful concept, the lovely, the lovely rainbow, the delicious meal. So what we're really doing is, and this is where Buddha's telling us how we're mistaken, we're confusing not only the event, thinking it's, we're, we're, we're first we're thinking the event is the cause, but even we think the event is the happiness itself is the suffering itself. And because what we, we think about, when we look at our memory, our memory, you know, we store memories in our mind, don't we? And we store the, we, we, we remember the meal. We remember the rainbow. We have a picture of the rainbow in our mind. We remember the fight with the boyfriend and the punch. So they're the things that, you know, we don't remember the feeling. We remember the thing externally. So that's what we think is the cause, number one. But even we think, that that's the suffering itself. That's the happiness itself. And Buddha's got a much more subtle, and I would say more precise presentation of it. He would say that that event, the cake, the punch, the rainbow, they are merely the catalysts they're like a secondary cause. A catalyst is a really good word in English. A catalyst is something that is kind of, it, it activates something. It doesn't play a direct role, it activates something. So it's a secondary cause. I mean, in Buddhist terms, you talk about a main cause and then there are secondary causes or conditions. So the main cause of a rose is the seed. It's pretty evident, but then it won't, you, you can hold a seed up in the sky for 27 years. You will never get a rose, even though it's the main cause because it needs various catalysts, various external conditions, various secondary causes to, that all have to come together with the seed in order to get the rose. So this is exactly like that for the Buddha in his understanding of happiness and suffering. So like we, you know, we talked in Zurich and some of you were there this weekend. Let's look at this. This is a really precise way to look at it. When we understand the mind in Buddhist psychology, you understand the Buddhist model of the mind, we learn there are lots of negative, unhappy, deluded, afflicted states of mind like anger, attachment, and jealousy. Then we have lots of positive, virtuous, optimistic, useful states of mind like love, compassion, generosity, intelligence. And the Buddha's essential point is that actions that we do based on the first lot, the negative ones, 
So seeds in our mind or program our mind, so seeds in our mind that will ripen as future experiences of suffering. It's like a natural law for the Buddha. It's not punishment or reward. It's just a natural law. That's the actual cause of my present suffering is the programming I've done in my mind from previous actions motivated by a negative state of mind, the actions that have harmed others. They are the main cause. They're like the seed. Then, or even more precise, those two causes, karma and delusions, the action and then the thought, the deluded thought. The main cause of the suffering is the thought, the deluded thought, the anger. And then on the basis of that anger, my body did an action of harming another. So that programmed my mind with that tendency and with those seeds. And then eventually those seeds ripen, you know, two lives later and I meet you and you punch me in the nose. So the main cause of that, even that event, is actually my karma, my action. That's a shock already to us. That's a big shock. This is Buddha's technical explanation. But the suffering does not refer to the punch, does not refer to the blood coming out of the nose, does not refer to the general event. Suffering is a state of mind. It's a mental state but it can also be a sensory experienced by the sensory consciousness. So suffering, it, and, you, and this is the point that what's most fascinating, we've got these three categories of states of mind, the negative, neurotic, deluded, ridiculous ones, then this, the positive, useful, productive ones, but then this third category, and I always like to call them the mechanics of the mind, it, like concentration, good memory, discrimination, alertness, intention, attention. There's many of these states of mind that are absolutely vital in order to function properly. So whether you're a murderer or a meditator, this is the point now, these are neither negative nor positive. They're neither virtuous nor non-virtuous, but they're absolutely vital. You know, if, you, if you're making a cake, you need concentration, you need good memory, you need alertness, you need intelligence, you know, the, forget intelligence. They're all these like the mechanics of the mind that enable you to do the cake properly. If you want to murder somebody, you better have good, in, you better have proper intention, not, sorry, not proper, forgive me. Intention means I will, it's volition, it's not motivation. Intention simply means I will kill Fred. Then you, you know, that, that's neither negative nor positive. What makes it negative or positive is the motivation in the second or the third category, a virtuous motivation or a non-virtuous motivation. But intention itself, it's the very meaning of the word karma. It means mental action. Everything exists on the tip of the wish, as Lama Zopa says. So intentions in the third category, the mechanics of the mind is there every millisecond. Then you've got attention. So the murderer will have, I will kill Fred. Then they have to pay attention and get the right gun and do the right shooting. They have to have concentration. They have to have good memory because if they get distracted, they'll forget what they were doing. So whether you're a murderer or a meditator, you need good memory, intention, attention, concentration. This is the point about these states of mind. Whether you're a, a, a positive person or a negative, whether the action is negative or positive, these play a role. So this, the meaning here is they're not non-virtuous and they're not virtuous, but they're totally necessary. This is not how we talk in our culture, you know? So now this is the point I'm getting to. There's another state of mind in that third category that's actually called feeling. Not how we use it like an equivalent of an emotion, you know? And there's only three kinds of feeling. This is it. Happy, unhappy, neutral. Well, let's forget the neutral, really, because they don't really play much of a, they're not vital. In this conversation about suffering and happiness, they don't play a role, okay? <clears throat> because happy is another word for pleasant. There's a whole spectrum of pleasant feelings. Happy, very mildly happy, blissfully happy, rapturous, ecstatic, joyful, pleasure, all these words are synonymous. And then neither, and they, this is like they're, they're states of mind, they're experienced by the mind, by definition, not the physical body. The sensory consciousness 
in combination with the body. So, you know, you've got a body, your tactile consciousness is conjoined with the nervous system. And if someone cut, if you're cut, that's the body that's cut, but because a mind is there, you will have a, a, an experience, a, an unpleasant feeling. You, you know, mentally an unpleasant feeling will arise. They are states of mind. So by definition, suffering and happiness are by definition things that exist in the mind. They are experienced by the mind. I mean, the words are simple. We really got to hear it because we really do believe that, the, that that boyfriend who harmed me, those people who harmed me, when we think of the suffering we're having, we think of them, not only as the cause, but we even think of that as the suffering. It's not accurate. It's just not accurate. Suffering is another word for unpleasant feeling. Happiness is another word for happy feeling. So they're states, they're in the mind, they're experienced by the mind. The physical thing that occurred, the punch, the ugly words, they are external. They are not suffering. They are not happiness. They are not even the main cause of my suffering. They're not even the main cause of my happiness. That person abusing me is a secondary cause, is a catalyst. The main cause of my suffering, number one, and the main cause of why that person I'm meeting at this moment is saying bad words to me, my past action and my delusions are the two main causes of that. This is really quite technical. We hear it in an emotional way. You know, we mix all these words up. This is why we need to study the Buddhist view of the mind. It's really quite precise. We need to think it through logically, technically, so we begin to become familiar with it. It's very hard for us because automatically, I believe that, that those abusive words are the cause of my suffering. Automatically, I believe those people are the cause of my suffering. And I believe that that's the suffering because we're not articulate enough about it. We're not precise about it. So we have virtuous states of mind, love, compassion, forgiveness, generosity. Those thoughts are the source of my happy feelings. Now and in the future. Anger, jealousy, resentment, attachment, they are the source of my pain right now and the cause of my future suffering. And then the actions I do on the basis of those virtues will cause me to meet that person. And then that person will be generous in return. And that action of their generosity, which is the direct result of my past action of generosity to them, one, and two, that generosity of that person to me is then triggers a happy feeling. But that happy feeling is the direct result of my past virtue. It's really quite technical. And once we get it clear, we can then learn to think it. And then we can learn to apply it in our daily life. This is literally how you put the Buddhist view of karma into practice in your daily life and start to change the way we exist. This is it, you know. I mean, we might all know it, but because we're so used to the samsaric interpretation the feeling of ego the feeling it's not fair the feeling how dare those people do it to me the feeling i don't deserve it all of this response which we all have this has not been critical is because we're addicted to the samsaric explanation that's the one that rises loudly in our mind that comes spontaneously and that we never question so it's really pretty intense but if we think we are Buddhist and we are trying to be Buddhist, then this is the logic we need to learn and apply every day. It's not just a feeling. It's not just liking karma. You've got to not just believing in karma. We've got to analyze it and say the words correctly and logically. And slowly we reprogram our mind and learn to interpret our life according to the Buddha's view, which is what our choice is. It's up to us, you know. It's very powerful. So being in samsara, quote unquote, is literally meaning being caught up in these deluded interpretations of our lives. That's the internal samsara. That's the real samsara. We often talk about samsara as being the sex and drugs and rock and roll out there that we think we're not supposed to have. That's very vague. 
You can talk about being in samsara in terms of going from life to life, if you like, but the real samsara is internal, being caught up in ego grasping and attachment and anger and jealousy and no cause and effect and the usual scenario that this is the, the instinctive view of ego. This is what being in samsara literally means, you know. So getting out of samsara means learning to reprogram our minds, learning these views I'm just describing, understanding karma, understanding happy feelings, understanding unhappy, where does it fit, understanding anger, understanding jealousy, understanding compassion, understanding the event, why that event, this, it's the nuts and bolts of Buddha's view of the universe. And that's what getting out of samsara means, re, it's like learning this new view. That's where the mistake is. We, we think of Buddhism. When I say we first heard Buddhism, we think, oh, well, I like Buddhism. Yeah, I believe in karma. Yes, it makes sense. That's because we've got a connection with it. But that's not enough. Just liking it or believing in it won't help you. It's like the same with botany. You can like botany. You love gardens and flowers. But if you don't know the meaning of botany, you don't know how to grow flowers and you don't know how to understand what they are. So it's obvious we have to learn it. Technically, precisely, it's precise technical explanation, you know. That's why we study. Then we've got the tools then to transform our lives and learn to give up suffering and its causes and therefore to get happiness and its causes. It's really not complicated. It's just that we, we complicate it because it's such an, a different view, you know, from the way we think. This is the point, isn't it? And it's hard work, but, you know, it's really hard work every day, every single day, looking at our experiences, interpreting it correctly, understanding the causes, practicing giving up the causes of suffering, practicing creating the causes of happiness. It takes time, you know, it really takes time. So ask me some questions now about that. Alexandra? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, for me, it's so many, it would be so much easier to understand these teachings if I, were, if I was a child. I would grow up with these teachings. For me, it would be, I think it would be much, much more easier because I understand everything you were saying, yes. the Buddhist teachings, I understand everything i've read i've heard i understand but the practice is is very it's difficult because you have to say right. you have to do it every every day right. the, the more you can every hour you you have to be aware because you can right. lost yourself in a way exactly. I, my question is is there any project to offer dharma dharma teachings to the children in an inviting way in some schools or institutions or because here in brazil in rio de janeiro I don't see any anyone no, do nothing no. like that. But. No, I, I do. I don't. I cannot tell you exactly, but I do know many people who are, are trying to do this. And I know in different countries there are programs for children. There are definitely that. And I totally agree with you. It really, may, when if you're brought up with this and it becomes natural, it makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? No, I know. I think. There are lots of programs. I think you have to research, you know. There are definitely programs. I hear of many people doing things like this, trying to put these things into very down-to-earth terms and providing it as part of children's education, definitely. But I can't point to any particular ones now. But it's a great one to think about for, you know, Rio de Janeiro, absolutely. It's wonderful, the fact that it occurs to you, Alexandra. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree with you. It's a perfect point, a very good point, yeah. yeah I have this in mind. If I... Good. set up a school in the future i wonderful. definitely Amazing. will offer these sessions yeah. to the children wonderful it's a great aspiration i admire that keep moving i used to i used to pass dharma to some football uh, students i had yes, yes. under 13 and the, yes. it, it makes totally different in their lives totally That's different right. amazing wonderful keep moving keep doing it yeah. it's fantastic well done thank okay, you so thank much. you for all, all your teachings thank okay, you it's a pleasure Hello, Shuki. Hey, I just want to offer to the guy from Rio de Janeiro to contact me later because there is a program for schools within FPMT in England. Very, very rich and very well structured. Well done. Okay. Discuss it with him, Alexander. That's great. Well done. Thanks, Shuki. That's wonderful. 
Who are those people? Talk to me. Questions. Roy. Okay, Roy. Anybody else? Questions? About suffering and its causes. Pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings. Dipti has her hand up. Hello, Dipti. Yes, talk to me, darling. Yeah, uh, I'm audible. Yes, please talk. Okay, what about those people, you know, who are living a good life? You have, they have good family, good job, everything is good. They don't understand the concept of suffering. How to... Well, say, sweetheart, the, how sound to really... the sound isn't so good, sweetheart. Can you say it again a bit more slowly? Okay. Um, there are people who are still happy in their lives. They have mm. good family, good job. That's right. And according to them, they are not suffering. Everything is right. going well. That's right. So why why do they really need to know about suffering and how to really make them aware about it? That's a very good point. It's a very good point indeed. So this is the interesting point, Dipti. When we look at the Four Noble Truths, this is Buddha's first teaching, and we learn that he, he has identified three levels of suffering. And the first one is the obvious one, which is when the bad things happen. So from that point of view, the people you're describing absolutely do not have that. That's very clear. And we know ourselves in one day, many nice things can happen. Your friend can be smiling at you. You can get a nice meal. It triggers pleasant feelings. So that is called happiness. It's absolutely correct. That means it's not like the suffering. So if you have the headache or, you know, or you, you hurt yourself, that's what we label suffering. So from the first point of view, it is completely accurate that in general, people who have good things happening, they're not experiencing the first kind of suffering. But the Buddhist point, and this is what's hard for us to see, we've got to look into it more carefully. It's quite more subtle. The Buddha talks about a second level of suffering, a more subtle level, and he would refer to it actually as the suffering of change. So on the simplest way of presenting that, but initially we don't like to hear this, it sounds rather depressing. Basically he says, um, and okay, basically, he says the second kind of suffering is actually what we refer to as happiness. In other words, when the good things are happening. So we have to then ask, well, that's interesting. Why does Buddha refer that to that as a subtler level of suffering? And it's because of this. That's why he calls it the suffering of change. Now, on the face of it, it seems rather kind of boring in a way, and it seems like it's a bit mean for Buddha to point it out, but let's analyze it. So a simple example of, let's say, a moment of suffering would be, let's say you're hungry, you're really hungry, and so you're having some mental suffering. So then the solution is to get the food. So that's what, so not having the food is what we would say is is causing us to have suffering feelings. So now the solution we would say is to get the food. So it's obvious, isn't it, that getting the food at the first moment immediate, immediately alleviates the grosser suffering of being hungry. We understand that, don't we, Dipti? That's so far so good, isn't it? Yes, I'm following. And now, if this, what is Buddha's getting us to analyze more, more carefully? It's true. And in fact, when you eat that delicious food, after you've felt the hungry feelings, the suffering feelings, it will trigger pleasant feelings. There is no doubt. But he says we've got to do deeper analysis. So let's analyze it. Let's say, okay, we believe. And so this is the point. The added point here is, when we have this samsaric view of attachment, attachment is this very strong emotional hunger within us that only wants the pleasant things. So uh, here now, attachment is kicking in and attachment believes that when I get the food, I'll get happy feelings. And you do, but attachment, this is the interesting point, attachment still not satisfied. So then we will have a second mouthful of that delicious cake. And why, even though the first mouthful did trigger pleasant feelings, we're not satisfied with those pleasant feelings. We want more pleasant feelings. So I will have another piece of cake and I'm anticipating more pleasant feelings. This is how attachment works. Attachment is like this emotional hunger. It's hungry, it's manipulating, it's, it's, it's kind of anticipating and it very much is never satisfied. So when I have my second mouthful of cake or my second piece of cake, I know it still continues to trigger 
pleasant feelings, but if you analyze it carefully, the pleasant feelings aren't as nice as the first ones. The pleasant feelings are diminishing, but we're still not satisfied, Dipti. So I'm going to have another piece of cake because attachment is still not satisfied. And it thinks if I have the third piece of cake, maybe I'll get satisfied. So I have the third piece of cake. And now we know if we do this analysis that that does still trigger some pleasant feelings, but they're even less pleasant than the second piece which were less pleasant than the first piece. And we know what happens. By the time you get to your fifth piece, because you're not satisfied with the pleasure you got already, eventually now the cake causes ugly feelings. It causes you to want to vomit. It causes you to feel stuffed. It then causes you to get acid reflux. It then causes you to have sickness afterwards. So in the end, the happy feelings that were triggered by meeting the cake which we believe is the cause of happiness, eventually turn into unhappy feelings and they're triggered by the same object. So at one moment, the cake causes pleasant feelings, but inevitably, inexorably, it eventually causes very unpleasant feelings. So this whole process is what we call happiness. So in it turns into suffering. Now we can, we can, I think this is a scientific explanation, but the trouble is we don't know how else to get happy feelings except this method. And so we, and then that's, so it seems rather cruel of Buddha to point this out. Now that's just a simple example of a cake, but look at people's lives. You know, you get the beautiful husband, you get the beautiful children, but then we know that it often turns into suffering. The husband starts being mean to you. The children reject you. You lose your money. Things change. I mean, this is the story of everybody in the universe. We have pleasant things, but they don't last. Then unpleasant things happen. This is the way it is. And I think this is not Buddha didn't make this up. This is the description of people's lives, but we don't like to think about it. What do you think, Dipti? I, I followed everything. It's perfect. I think, but there comes one more question. Um, so uh, that means suffering is good because suffering is leading us to. Uh, I can't. Again, your voice is a bit. Bit, it's not so clear, Dipti. I'm so sorry. So just speak a bit more clearly again, because the microphone seems to be. Uh, right. so, go on. I'm um, you Yes. Go yes, on. venerable. Uh, okay. Am I audible now? Clear, clear, loud and clear? Good. Yes, yes. So I have another question. This from the explanation of yours, Venerable. Yes. Uh, that what about, um, that means suffering is good because it is leading us to the path of meditation, liberation. So in what ways do you think suffering is good? Tell me any two, three You're things absolutely about right. it. No it's, no, it's a very good example. It's a very, it's, I mean, it's, again, speak simple examples. Let's say, you know, you're riding a bike and then you fall off the bike. Well, if you're, you know, you'll hurt yourself. So one response is to get angry and want to sue the bike maker. But the other response is to learn from the experience, to learn from that, to learn from that suffering so that you think, okay, what can I do to ride my bike so I don't fall off again? So of course, this is the whole point. We can learn from our suffering. Suffering can become one of the most profound experience if we learn from it learn from it so that we can avoid it in the future that's the point that's really the approach to a spiritual path not you know that's the point but we have to, i mean everybody has suffering but we mostly don't learn from it we just get angry and we blame everybody and it increases our suffering so if we're intelligent we can learn from our suffering and that may, exactly the same as a simple example like falling off your bike nothing cosmic you can learn from it so that you don't fall off again. It's very practical. And that's really what the spirit, why you turn to a spiritual path. Absolutely. We can learn from it. And then our suffering enriches our lives. Don't we want to want to romanticize suffering? I mean, we if we can avoid suffering, please avoid it. It's not as if we have to have it. But if we do have it, we learn from it, we learn the causes and we learn the solution so that we don't have it again. It's very intelligent. Makes sense, doesn't it? Completely. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Very good points. Thank you so much. I have a question yeah. in the chat from Roy. He says, okay, Thank Roy. He says, Thank you very much, Venerable. In the four immeasurables, happiness and joy are treated separately, but you said they are synonyms. Would be grateful to know if there is a difference. 
Oh, I don't, I don't know. You have to tell me which um, which version of the prayer then, because I can't think of them as, I don't know which one that is. Can somebody, give, can Roy give me the words of the particular version he does? Roy, would you like to unmute? Or write it down, Roy. Let um, me know the, um, uh, uh, the, the prayers which uh, I have, um, uh, I really don't know which version it is, but I do remember very clearly, it says that uh, may all beings be happy and be free from the causes of suffering. And may all beings be always joyful and may they always remain in a state of equanimity. And so I've always wondered if there is a difference between joy and uh, it's a really good point, Roy, and I think it's a question of, of, of which translation. The one that I know, the one that I, I would say these words, it says, it's, it's a longer version. It says, may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free of attachment, ignorance, and hatred. Then it says, may all sentient beings be free of suffering and its causes. And then it says, may all beings be have happiness and its causes. And then it says, may all sentient beings never be parted from liberation's excellent bliss, which is liberation, which is nirvana. So the point is very clear though, Roy, in yeah. the, you know, that the word happiness, joy, ecstasy, rapture, um, pleasure, these are all definitely synonyms. They're just a question of levels of happy feelings, levels of pleasure. I think in the English language, we will use them in very distinct ways, but in the Buddhist psychological model, they are all synonymous. It's all a question of degree. So, you know, for example, Lama Yeshi in his commentary on the Mahamudra practice, and he talks about the qualities we would experience when we get single pointed concentration, when we experience shamatha. The, this is the Buddhist teaching. When we have completely accessed the subtle level of our mind, and I've got single point of concentration, one of the clear consequences is that because delusions have temporarily ceased, and because the sensory consciousness has ceased, our mind experiences incredible joy, incredible pleasure. In other words, incredibly happy feelings. And Lama even uses the words rapture ecstasy. I mean, this sounds hilarious to us. This is the natural state of a mind when it's in single pointed concentration. And eventually, when we have got cut samsara, when we have cut all the delusions from our mind, one of the direct results is that our mind is always joyful, always happy, always blissful. This is a very powerful point. So these words are all synonymous because in the Buddhist model of the mind, in the third category, you have the word feeling, and there's only three kinds of feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Are we communicating, Roy? That's right, Thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. See, this is the interesting point about when we look at Buddha's analysis of samsara, it's very evident we all want to be happy and don't want suffering, even if we think of it as the simplest level. And Buddha, in a sense, takes this as a fundamental basis of all his teachings. And he says, well, listen, everybody wants happiness. Nobody wants suffering. And guess what, guys? I've found a method. This is really all he's saying. And this is what's so fascinating. So... Um, and what he's telling us, basically, I have found methods. This is all he's saying. I have found methods of how to stop suffering feelings all the time and therefore to have happy feelings all the time without the happy feelings turning into suffering, which is how we experience things now. We know there's no happy feeling that we have at the moment that doesn't eventually fade and turn into either can't be bothered or into unhappy feelings. In other words, they, they do change, but because we only know happy feelings that, that don't last, it sounds almost shocking to think that there are methods for how to get happy feelings that never turn into unhappy feelings. But this is exactly what Buddha is saying. So basically, being in samsara means that we totally believe 
that happy feelings are what we get when we get what attachment wants. That's our method. And Buddha's saying, no, 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 they're limited. Then they're too limited. He says, no, happy feelings are what we will get eventually when we have given up attachment. Very simple. Eventually realizing emptiness. Then you will have discovered the true nature of your mind. You will have discovered its natural potential for joy continuously. That's peaceful and virtuous. This is the simple thing that Buddha is saying, which is very, very encouraging. It's just that it's hard work because we are addicted to believing the happy feelings come from boyfriends and jobs and cakes and rainbows and external phenomena. We have no other method for having them. Whereas Buddha's found methods, even just getting single pointed concentration. And he says, we've had it in countless lifetimes. Just that, as Lama Zep Yeshi points out in his Mahamudra book, we get such bliss. I mean, we almost feel a bit embarrassed to talk about it. It sounds like naughty, you know, but this is the Buddha's point. The mind in concentration is naturally, utterly blissful. But the trouble is we can get we can still have attachment to it and get caught up in that bliss and then forget all about sentient beings. This is why you've got to have the two wings of the bird, wisdom and compassion. But this is a technical point that Buddha is making. His methods are methods to stop suffering and its root causes and thus to get happiness and to then that to not change into the suffering feelings. That's literally what it is. And so it's, it's very encouraging, but it's just hard work, that's all. Yes, Alona. Thomas. Yes, Alona. Go on, darling, talk to me. Hello, Venerable. Thank you for oh, your you teaching. Yes. yes, darling. Um, I was thinking uh, the topic suffering of suffering. Uh, you know, my family lives in Ukraine and, uh, you know, Putin is surrounding Ukraine is planning to go in and, and uh, feels like it's going to be a war. And uh, I am terrified, you know, because my family and all the people on both sides, nobody wants to war. But me, you know, I feel such that I have very, very heavy feeling on my chest. I don't suffer like mentally. I do try not to build up, you know, what's going to happen to my family. But it feels like very heavy physically. And that's just such a big thing that I don't know if I can help. I pray for it, for all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's, um, I, how can I, you know, let myself be, live my life and, you know, like have happiness anyway. Understand, and, darling. And this is a really yeah. good question. It's a really good question. This is why we've got to have the two wings of the bird. So basically what you're describing is you're seeing somebody suffering and you have compassion. This is incredible. But the point is that compassion is very limited if we haven't given up attachment and anger and jealousy and haven't understood karma and haven't even eventually realized emptiness. This is the point now. Any level of suffering you will experience in your mind is technically, literally the cause, of the result of you still having delusions, you still having attachment and anger and fears. It's not criticism, it's technical. And so the compassion you have is fantastic, but it's limited because, you know, you, you are, it'll also be caught, like you said, this heavy feeling inside you. That is your mind, that is mental. And that's because you have delusions. So if you, if you imagine you were a bodhisattva who's given up delusions, imagine that, you would have this enormous compassion, but you wouldn't have suffering. This is what's the most peculiar, interesting concept. We wouldn't have suffering. So right now we've got compassion, but then you feel a bit hopeless because you know there is not much you can do. If you can go to Ukraine tomorrow and change things, please, you go, you know. But we know we can't. And that's where our attachment, our fears, our anxiety take over. And that's where it's difficult, Alona. So all we can do sometimes, if you have faith in the Buddhas, all you can do is do that and try and just be courageous and be brave and keep your mind steady and continue to have compassion, but by understanding karma, understanding the mind, applying all of this, at least gives you an explanation of it, and then do the best you can, sweetheart, because we can see that often we can't change things. 
And the more we have attachment and anxiety and anger, the more we suffer and the less you can be useful to others. That's why we've got to do the wisdom wing first. Then our compassion becomes very powerful and very wise. Do you understand, yes. sweetheart? Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank yes, you, thank darling. you. And to never give up working on yourself so you can benefit others. That's the long-term goal, darling. Yes, I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hello, Abelardo. Talk to me. How are you? Unmute. There we go. Yeah. Okay, yes, thank you very go. much, Venerable. Uh, <clears throat> uh, sometimes when one uh, hears about uh, karma, uh, karma, karmic seeds, like in fact, yes. A former lives and so on. Um, it, one thinks that karma is like an automatic uh, cause and effect type of, uh, process, uh, but ultimately it all goes through the mind, isn't it? Uh, I mean, um, if one does, a, a, let's say, a negative action, um, negatively motivated, it's, oh. it's not that it's inexorably going to have a negative consequence upon oneself. Uh, it, it may or may not, but depending on many factors, right? Uh, it, it, ultimately, mental is the, the primary factor. That, that's what I understood. Uh, because some people, you know, they, they, they approach karma like, like it's a, a, an invisible automatic uh, cause and effect mechanism that one cannot avoid the consequences, but... Uh, uh, okay, I think that. what I'm hearing you, no, I understand your point. I think what I'm hearing you say, when we talk about karma, we think it's kind of fatalistic and set in stone. Yeah. So on the one hand, I, that's why I like to use ordinary examples. We know perfectly well that when we really learn botany, it is a very logical, coherent and consistent law. It's not as if one day the rose seed brings a, a peach or something. Rose seeds will bring roses. Certain conditions put together will guarantee that you will get a rose. But it's flexible insofar as we can then add different conditions and change things and pull out the weeds and change the amount of water, but the, still the law is coherent. So karma is a coherent natural law. Buddha observed it. He didn't make it up and no one's running it, but it's very, it's, it's, you know, if you're a clever botanist, you can do infinite things to make roses better, to make them worse. So it's not as if you sit back and see it passively set in stone. You're absolutely right. And that's why we can, there's no karma we can't change. We can, right. any, we, can, we can put atomic bombs under all our karmic seeds and prevent them from ripening. That's what purification practice is. That's why we should live in vows. These are the methods to change our karma. But karma is still a natural law that's consistent and coherent. No contradiction. So, so there, could, there could be a case, for example, where say one, one knows one has done something negative that harms has harmed someone. Um, and uh, uh, one can take uh, measures of repentance uh, right. and reparation uh, and right. not necessarily suffer the, the negative consequences. Absolutely, uh, that's the point. There's no karmic seed we can't pull out before it ripens. If it's ripened, the best we can do is work with it. But there's no yeah. karmic seed we've planted in the past that we can't purify. That's why purification practice every day is really vital. It's like yeah. work, It's like pulling out the weeds before, or pulling out the seeds before they even grow. That's really what's very dynamic. Otherwise, it becomes very fatalistic and hopeless. You know, that's exactly very right. Good. Exactly right. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a really, really important point. Because we're not used to thinking, you see, I think in our life, in our culture, we tend to think it's all just accidental. No one knows why things happen. We're all a bit fatalistic. And then when we hear that there's law existing, we go to the other extreme and think it's all set in stone and we're kind of paralyzed by it. But it's just a dynamic, it's a dynamic, it's very dynamic, you know. And we, if you learn it, you can learn to, I mean, if you learn botany, you can grow really good gardens. There's no garden you can't change, you know. It's just like our life, same thing, yeah. It's a very good point. So what else do you as people? We've got 10 minutes to go. I have a question in the chat. Um, good. Uh, Venerable, can you please explain emptiness in brief? Okay. It's the, it's the subtlest interpretation of all of Buddha's 
interpretations of the universe. So the very so we we go gradually in order. The broad point that Buddha is making across the board is that we suffer finally because we have misconceptions in the mind about happiness, suffering, why things happen, blah, blah, blah. Basically, that's the point he makes across the board, that the degree to which our minds are caught up in these misconceptions, these afflictions, these delusions about you know, basically the emotional ones called anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, but also misconceptions like there is no cause and effect, misconceptions about creator, misconceptions about thinking your mind is the brain, all the philosophical views that Buddha, repre Buddha presents about reality. He is telling us that they are reality. He's not forcing us to believe him. He's not being dogmatic. He is simply presenting what he has found to be true. And essentially what he's saying is, gradually in your practice, you are learning to listen to Buddha's views about reality, for example, impermanence, for example, karma, for example, no creator, for example, the brain isn't your mind, for example, these are a few views, the more we learn to get in touch with those views and take them as our hypothesis, and then slowly practice living in those views and eventually through our practice proving those views that is his method for getting happy that's his method for quitting suffering so impermanence is one of the gross misconceptions we have then we may go to more subtle we understand about karma and then we go to eventually the subtlest one which is what's implied by the, all these earlier ones, it all leads to this subtlest one, that there's nothing that exists that, that basically is set in stone. There's nothing ex that exists that doesn't change moment by moment, that's impermanence. And there's finally nothing that exists that, 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 um, that is set in stone, concrete, inherent, independent he says there's nothing in set in nothing exists that isn't an interdependent that isn't the, a product of many conditions coming together everything is interdependent everything is a dependent arising and this is the proof that nothing has an intrinsic nature so it's his holiness the dalai lama said one time to a question how do i apply emptiness in daily life and his holiness answered so marvelously seemingly simply but profoundly learn to see things from another point of view so when we're caught up in this root delusion this is known as ignorance and it's known colloquially as ego grasping when it's you clinging to your own con concrete sense of self your mind is set in stone you're absolutist about everything this is right that is wrong this is black that is white we can there's no nuance there's no way of seeing things interdependently our mind is freaked out it's very concrete it's very absolutist this is the consequence of not understanding dependent arising and therefore emptiness. So this marvelous method of seeing when something goes wrong or when something's delicious, you step back and you see it from another point of view. That's the proof that nothing is set in stone. I mean, in other words, this is why my friends in prison are such profound examples. They've got a life sentence. They can't escape out of that prison. It is ugly conventionally it is an ugly place but because they're practicing they can lit they've literally learned to see the prison from another point of view they see that this is a good opportunity they learn to practice so what's the consequence of this they become happy but if we're set in stone this is bad this is wrong i can't change it it can't change you only suffer and you suffer more and more and more so there's a simple way of applying this teaching that nothing has an intrinsic nature, that nothing is absolute, that nothing is independent. Everything exists in dependence upon how you see it. There's a simple way of saying it. That's the meaning of emptiness. It's very practical, you know, and this is a courageous way to live our lives. So conventionally, a prison is an ugly place. You can't argue with that. 
ultimately there's no intrinsic prison. So if you have the view, prison is ugly, prison is bad, how dare I be in prison, it's not my fault, you will only ever suffer and your suffering will get worse and worse. But like some of my friends, they accepted the reality they're in prison, they've tried to get out, they've done their appeals, they've been turned down. So then they see prison differently. They find the way to see it as good. This is in the Bodhisattva teachings. We learn about how to learn to transform our problems into happiness. This is rooted in the teaching about there is no intrinsic this or that. We can apply it in daily life and it's the method for becoming happy. That's a way of talking about it. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Somebody else there, anybody, Mary Ellen? I don't have any more in the chat. Did anybody else have a question? Okay. Yes, can I ask a question? Absolutely, please do. Yes, Nanda Kumar. Uh, <clears throat> the, in the Indic uh, <clears throat> way of thinking, the ultimate is to get released from the bondage. Yes. Of all this samsara. Yes. And there's imperson, impermanence. Mm -hmm. Now, in the uh, Buddhist way of thinking, uh, in Mahayana and Hinayana, mm -hmm. it is, uh, you said, uh, out of the three states, the pleasant, the unpleasant, and the neutral, mm -hmm. you said the pleasant state that you want to reach. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, go on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, whereas in the Indic mm -hmm. way of thinking from which this came about, yes, older than Buddhism, yes, uh, it talks about uh, nirguna state. That is, a, the new uh, what is called a char characteristic less state. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Very good point. This is an yes. interesting point. Yeah, this so, is actually go on. So yeah. there, you there, your share. You're saved from both happiness and unhappiness yes. because I hear you. The good part is you can't become unhappy, nor can you become happy. So it, the good part I is that you're, yeah. So whereas here, so it's moksha. Moksha is beyond. It, you're liberated. You're I hear it, you. beyond. I mean, you can correct me if I go wrong. You, it's beyond yeah. enlightenment. It is reaching a state where you you are away from all these terrible things. So there's no question of you. getting involved. Either on, on either side. I hear so, you saying. Me, I do hear you. Clarification. Yes. Mm. So I think there's a way of talking that, you know, for example, um, okay, there are three levels of suffering. The first kind of suffering is when the bad things happen. The second kind of suffering is when the good things happen. But this third one, and this is, I think, where Buddha did diverge from the previous views, and I haven't studied them, please forgive me. When you're in the subtlest state of the formless realm, it's absolutely right. You have neither pleasant nor unpleasant feelings, and that's the subtlest state. But the Buddha would say it's not far enough. He would suggest, and that's where he diverged, I think, and he said, he, I think his view there was that the, the views about emptiness weren't complete I mean you can argue with me there too and so the whole thing is when you've achieved liberation from samsara by realizing emptiness by realizing selflessness and you've achieved your nirvana your mind actually they say it would be in complete bliss if you're just on the hinayana path and you've achieved your nirvana you've achieved the selflessness you've gone beyond all levels of suffering including the third one and you've now out of samsara you then zap into this blissful state subtle blissful state of nirvana that's liberation from suffering and its causes because you realize selflessness you've gone beyond the three levels pleasant unpleasant and neutral and now your mind is in this blissful state of liberation. But then if you want to be on the Mahayana path, they actually say that the Buddha will come along and tap you on the shoulder and say, okay, honey, you're now liberated from suffering in this, and you give up that bliss. They say giving up that bliss is the worst suffering in the universe. It is bliss, but you're beyond samsara. You don't have any ego anymore. But you then now come back into the human realm. You apply, you practice bodhicitta. You become an amazing bodhisattva and you eventually become a Buddha. 
So then you would say your mind is big as the universe. You pervade the universe. You can manifest in billions of bodies to help billions of sentient beings throughout the universe. And your mind now is utterly free of any of it. But you act, but you live in the world, among the world, but not part of the world. But you would say still that always, as long as any mind exists from this Buddhist perspective, is there's always either pleasant, unpleasant, or happy, or neutral. But when you're a Buddha, there's not a possibility for anything other than joyful states of mind, but they're not within samsara. It's just a natural state of mind because there's always feeling of some kind. And especially when Buddhas manifest in bodies looking like ordinary people, they're not in samsara, but they kind of pretend. But their minds are only ever joyful, but it's, it's liberated joy. You could say it like that. What do you think? Uh, again, uh, you can correct me if I go wrong. Now, is this state the ultimate state for the monkhood or for the lay person? The for everybody. Person. It's the same. It's, it's just you choose the path. That's all. The, the, in the Mahayana view, the goal is to give up the first kind of suffering, to give the second kind of suffering, and the third. And the method for... So the way to stop the first kind of suffering is to give up harming others. The way to stop the second kind of suffering is give up attachment. The way to stop the third kind of suffering, which be, would be the formless realms, the subtlest state of deepest absorption, is to realize emptiness. And then you are free and you can you can add bodhicitta to the mix. And you then basically you're out of samsara, you've achieved liberation, and then you could even achieve Buddhahood now. And if your mind weren't manifesting in human bodies to benefit others, you'd just be in this subtle state of the Dharmakaya, this state of bliss that pervades the universe, that's infinitely wise, omniscient, and infinitely compassionate. But out of compassion, you will man because of bodhicitta, you will effortlessly manifest in countless bodies to be of sentient beings in all the realms of existence. So the ultimate state is Buddhahood, but that's a very proactive state because it's to benefit others. But the state of a mind that's enlightened is the pure, unmanifest, all-pervasive, all-compassionate, all-wise Dharmakaya. Uh, if it is for the layman, you have... It's when you both, live in, the same, it's the same. Both of us, all of us have the same potential. Uh, when you live in this samsara-ridden world, there are, even in the Buddhist way of thinking, you say there's nothing that exists by itself. Everything is interdependent. That's right. So in that if you go even by that logic, if you are in this samsara ridden world of the layman, uh, one has to, again, you can correct me if I go wrong, one has to take into account that everything is interdependent and your state of mind is has to be catering for the other state of mind, which may or may not take it in a pleasant or unpleasant way. So you have to be doubly you have to do defensive living to ensure that the other uh, the other layman is not inconvenienced or given an unpleasant experience this is, this is how you know there's wisdom and compassion so the wisdom there's a nice analogy a bird needs two wings wisdom and compassion so the wisdom wing <laughs> is the achieving of your own nirvana when you've achieved that but you're also on the compassion wing even though you don't need to be reborn in samsara you are finished but you will choose to be reborn because of your bodhicitta. And then you are effortlessly able to do that as a layman, as a, a mega rich commercial guy, as a monk, as a mother, it doesn't matter now. You are effortlessly able because of your wisdom and because of your bodhicitta, you can act exactly in whatever way is most beneficial for others. That's, an end, that's the end result. But you know, that's, that's the person who's accomplished the goal. But the practice, it's the same. You can be a great lay practitioner with a wife and five children and learn and have your meditation, realize emptiness, achieve bodhicitta. It's up to your capability. Somebody else will go to the mountains and be a yogi. We're finally, the job is the same for all of us. We have to choose our path according to our capability. Uh, very simple day-to-day -day <clears throat> requir requirement. Supposing <clears throat> you're faced to danger from another living being yeah. and you got to fend off the danger because if supposing the other person giving you that danger is a sentient being and yes that's right person is likely to suffer bad karma yes. because of what he's going to do to you exactly exactly you take defensive action to that's ensure right. 
two yes. things. One is that you yourself don't get hurt, and the other person also doesn't suffer bad no, karma. You were, no, it depends on where you're at, you know, Nanakan Kumar. It depends on where you're at in your own spiritual path. Let's assume you're more advanced. If you're a bodhisattva, you'd have no concern about your harm to yourself. You would only be concerned about harm to the other, And but you could do a, 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 su a supposed negative action purely for their benefit. It's all a question of where you're at. If you're only at a level of trying to give up attachment, then you do your best not to harm the other person. And you, I mean, it's all a question of where you're at. We can't talk in absolute terms. It's up to what your spiritual realizations are, the degree to which you're able to handle that. But if you're a householder with 10 people depending on yeah, you. But you could be a bodhisattva as a householder. You could be a highly no. evolved being as a bodhisattva. Are you talking about a simple, ordinary, samsaric ordinary. householder or an advanced samsaric. householder? Some side, because then you have to look after yourself, not for I, yourself, no. but to people dependent on yes, you. Yes, that's right. So what's your question then? I hear your point so very clearly. What's the question? If there was no one dependent on you, you could leave it to fate or whatever happens. You are not affected. But right, so there's the people dependent the on question? you, you've got to look after yourself. So what's the question? So therefore, you got to take some actions which, right. may not, you, which may not be in the pleasant realm. Yeah, but what's the question? So therefore, the question of then you have to act in different ways That's right. with, when you're beset with different responsibilities. That's right, exactly. So you, all the things you're saying, I agree with, but I want a question from all this. So, and therefore, there is no thumb rule. It has to be situation based. Of course it is. I mean, are you asking me a question or, or telling me something? So I need to I'm know. I'm asking whether you, when yes. you apply all this, the yes. teaching, yes. you got to very, very intelligently interpret it in different right. situations. Right. Different and this is, this is why the fundamentals in this, if you're on the Mahayana path, you want to have the basis for your decision will be not to harm the basis and your basis for decision will be wisdom and the basis for decision will be how to benefit this person now if you have compassion you might even you know harm the person to stop them from harming it's like tough love if you're a good father you tell your child i've told you no more you go to your room your motivation can be totally pure so that's where the motivation is crucial that's what determines the karma we create the more advanced we are the more powerful and clear our good motivation and you're absolutely right in what you're saying it's very good are we communicating thank you, thank thank you, you. so much very kind I think it's time we go home now, Mary Ellen. It is. We are out of time today. And if you have further questions, if you could hold them for another Next week. Program. We'll have Nick. Is this the last talk, though, isn't it? This is, this is the last in the series. We better have the last two questions in. Come on, Robin. We'll have the last two questions. Come on, Robin. And then uh, Abelardo. Go, Robin. Well, honorable. Could you please touch on addiction how that relates to samsara i'm a recovering addict i understand darling basically the buddha's term for it is attachment it sounds such a cute word for us but it's multifaceted as far as buddha's concerned we are all addicts we are all junkies it's just a question of degree and a question of the object and that's not even meant to be sarcastic so when we understand buddha's analysis of attachment it'll really you'll really hear the point it's this primordial emotional hunger that we're all born with a question of degree that always wants something more is never satisfied and that attachment it, we dump it onto boyfriends cakes alcohol heroin and we can see that obviously in our culture we're called an addict with the object is pretty intense but we are addicted to food we're addicted to praise we're addicted to money we're addicted to getting things the way we want. It's multifaceted. So really, the more we understand the Buddhist view of attachment, it completely encompasses what we mean by addiction. Do you understand, Robin? Yes, thank you. I thank you very much. And now, Abelardo, what's the question? Yes. Okay. Um, when we were, you were talking before about uh, the form and formalist realms, um, uh, well, I, my understanding is that uh, there's a desire realm that, that has uh, the, uh, the, the, the negative uh, place, uh, states, uh, places, uh, hell, the hungry ghosts, uh, and animals, humans, the, 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 the semi-gods and gods, okay? Uh, 
then you have the, the form form realm yes, that's and right. you have the formless realms. Yes, My exactly. question is, are, are, are these places like some people believe or are these states of mind? They're all, okay, that's a good point. Every single one of them from the hells to the peak of samsara are all states of mind. But when we understand the Vajrayana model of the universe, Abhilada, we'll understand that the universe is consisting of the four elements and all minds are inextricably linked to their own set of the four elements. So a hell realm sentient being is a being whose mind as a result of negativity is intensely suffering, but their mind is conjoined with the four elements. And you could argue that their mind is conjoined with the fire element. So you have the karmic appearances of nightmarish suffering. Spirits, as a result of attachment, their minds, you could argue, are mainly conjoined with the air energy. And they have intense sufferings of attachment and grasping. You, you know, we've all got the four elements. Gods, as a result of lots of virtue, their minds are conjoined with subtle light. That's the fruit of virtue. So whatever our mind does impacts upon the elements that our minds are conjoined with, and that brings our physical experience of hells, spirits, animals, gods, and the form and formless realm, the formless especially, there's no gross um, uh uh, it's just a total st subtle state of mind in the deepest of absorption. There's not even any other aggregates, you know. But all minds are conjoined with the four elements. That's the Vajrayana. And that means, and then the, the external environment, everybody has karmic appearances. Hell beings have a karmic appearance of external environment. We all have external environment, and that's created by karma as well. So all of them. But the formless realm is just a subtle state of the deepest absorption. That's a neutral state of mind. So, so uh, the way of knowing about uh, these the existence of these different realms uh, is yeah. uh, through through uh, mental uh, yeah. states. As you, when you get clairvoyance, when you get single pointed concentration, you already get clairvoyance. And as you continue to practice and remove delusions from your mind, this capacity to see the past and the future and the minds of others increases, increases, and increases. This is a fundamental part, and this is coming back from the ancient, you know, the marvelous great scholars from before the Buddha. This is what the amazing techniques they have discovered. The ability of the mind to see the past and future and things that the grosser mind can't see. This is when we start to prove these things to be true from our own direct experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that's enough for this time. People will see each other, I don't know when, somewhere on the moon, in the planet, in the sun, or see you in the skies, Mami Yeshi says. All right, everybody. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you, everybody, for your wonderful questions, all of you. So kind. Much Thank you so us. much, Venerable Rabina. Thank you, Venerable Rabina. Thank you, Rabina. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.